for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right, good evening. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. It is Monday, January 23rd, 2023. And our guest tonight is Leslie Kane. And we're going to jump straight into it uh, tonight. And, of course, uh, Leslie's a writer, a journalist, uh, an author, a researcher with a focus over the last few decades on UFOs. But lately, some life after death um, has entered the picture, too, as well. Extremely compelling and interesting. And with all of that, let's just get straight to it and say, Leslie, good evening. Good evening. How you doing, Jimmy? I am fantastic, young lady. And listen, it's been a while since you've been on the show. So before I say, what have you been up to? Uh, welcome back. It's uh, really great to see you and, and hear from you. Great to be on with you. It's been a, it has been a while. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so much is. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, right. right. So much, so much has gone down, and uh, and and we'll do all of that. And I promise everybody that uh, is is listening right now. We'll we'll get to um, some new stuff and and what is going on today. But um, I got a hold of Les Leslie. I'm just going to throw you under the bus just a little bit. Uh oh. I was. Um, I was reading uh, for, I don't know uh, how many times now, I went back and cracked open on the record. And and I did it for my own reasons. There's so much going on, you know, politics in the Department of Defense and and, and everything in the media. And and I went in and knocked the dust off of that. 2010, right? We're in 2023. And uh, started reading it, and I put the book down uh, after the second night, and I said to myself, "I gotta, I gotta call Leslie tomorrow, and and I've, I've, I've got to do a show." And the reason for me reaching out, which I said to you, was mm -hmm. that. I want to talk about you. <laughs> and and, and I, I don't know the last time somebody has said that to you because, it, you know, it's all UFOs and UAPs, you know, all the time now. But uh, that's what I did. And you you said, let's do this. Uh, I, I think that's a great idea. And that's that was my vision for tonight. So are you down? Sure. Yeah. You said you want to talk about the book. And just to say the full title, it's UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials go on the record. So yeah, I think on the record's a great abbreviation for that long title. Yeah. Well, I've never heard it I've never heard it called that before, so that's it, good. Yeah, and uh here's here's the thing with that. Um that book when it came out was right when you were sort of wrapping up things in South and Central America and, and certainly um in Washington DC with with things that you were working on at that time but it does it never starts there if i, I want to go back let's go let's go back back um the interest in the subject of ufos uh today uaps uh, let's stay with ufos tonight um uh had to start somewhere did you have a sighting as a child or a crazy aunt or uncle that had been abducted? What, what, what got this going? Well, the way it got started for me was it was in 1999. I received a copy of the Cometa report, a translation of it. And I, I, your list, your, your listeners probably know what that report is, that French study. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it. But it was, in, it, you know, I was a journalist. I was at a public radio station at the time covering all kinds of topics on a daily show. And then this colleague sent me this report, this 90 page study, and it just blew my mind. Um, so it wasn't because I'd had any sightings or anything. I, it was the 
the quality of that report and the fact that it was written by generals and admirals and really, really high level French officials. And then they drew the conclusion that the best explanation that they could provide for the phenomena they studied was the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I mean, they said that in black and white and that was radical in those days. Nobody was, you know, nobody at generals and admirals were generally not saying that publicly. Um, you know, it was such a different time uh, that, then than it is now. So, and I just thought, you know, they said it was the most valid, rational, and logical hypothesis to explain the cases they studied. And these were all official cases with really good data. So I just jumped on that as a journalist. It was really my journalistic, in, you know, interest that got me going on it. And then <clears throat> I published a story in May of 2000 in the Boston Globe based on this report. And that was really a challenge to even get something published on this in those days. And then from that moment on, I was completely captivated by this. And I just never, never stopped. Now, were, you, were you ever concerned with the stigma, you know, the UFO stigma in, in media and journalism? Because pretty much it's the kiss of death, or at least that's what they'll tell you. You, you, you know, let, let's do something about this over here. It's a little safer. Were you concerned about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was a big deal then. And when I was working on that first story, I remember I was working at this public radio station in Berkeley, California, which considered itself to be very progressive. But nonetheless, I was afraid to even let anybody there know that I was working on this topic. It was so and and they what little if I showed it, you know, if I mentioned it a little bit, there were snickers and laughter and um, and then, yeah, so I mean, I was I was concerned about it. And I but I felt like once that Boston Globe story came out, I had some legs to stand on because that was a really reputable publication. It was a serious story with no sensationalism or exaggeration or claims or anything else. And so I felt like I had that to stand on after that. And at that point, I just felt that the the taboo was so so irrational and crazy to me. I, I just, it took me a while to even understand that it existed and what it was like. And then I was like, what the hell is this? Why does nobody care about this? And it sort of became part of my my journey was to, to figure all of that out. And then over the years, I got to watch it gradually decrease, but it was a really a big deal in the beginning. What, what did you, versus where you were before you read the uh, uh, Commuter Report, um, what was your foundation with UFOs? Was it just Hollywood, you know, and, and that side of things, or did you learn something significant and get a takeaway from the Commuter Report? Well, I had read, I remember reading Communion. So I had read, and I might've even read Bud Hopkins's um, book at Intruders. the same time. That I, yeah. Or, or Missing Time. But I do remember um, staying up most of the night reading uh, Communion and being terrified. Um, so, you know, and I had some friends that lived in the Hudson Valley during the Hudson Valley wave. They were telling, so I, I had this definite curiosity about UFOs, but it wasn't any more than I think any average person would have who read that book, you know? And yeah, so there, what I learned from that Kemet report, I definitely learned something new, which was that officials at this high level were taking it seriously and were studying it. And that was something I hadn't seen before. At least here in the United States, right? Well, I mean, and I'm sure, you know, if I had been researching this, there were all these FOIA documents that had been released in the 70s. And there was lots of evidence that our government, you know, there was Project Blue Book. I mean, all of that, I hadn't looked into that yet. It was all new to me at that time. So it was, it took me years to really get a handle on, you know, to do all the research and get and, and, and learn who were the people that I could trust and who were the serious people and who weren't, it was, it was a mess, you know, right. uh, uh, things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> I, guess not. I think it's better now, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it's better. But what I mean by that is the, uh, the whole aspect of UFO 101. And, um, you know, when we look at today, because so much has been brought into this, uh, so many new faces and people and uh, a general interest in this, but they don't have that foundation, right? That UFO 101. It's kind of like the Nimitz and Forward, right? Or 2017 in the New York Times and Forward, where they don't have that foundation. Well, who doesn't? Who doesn't have the foundation? Who, who do you mean? Uh, those that are suddenly hearing about UFOs for the first time. They don't know about oh, the yeah. history. That's right. I think it's important to contextualize it, you know, for people. And I, I like to do that as much as I can when I 
get the rare opportunity to write an article for the Times. Ralph Blumenthal and I always try to provide as much context as we can, but we have limited space. So yeah, it takes a long time to get a handle on it and to see it in the in the context that everyone needs to understand it in. It's really true. It's it's one of the funnest rabbit holes. <laughs> oh yeah. You just you open up something and there's that and you you could spend months you know in this direction or go into this direction and it's like the right. gift that keeps on giving. It it's not just one singular event, is it? No, it's true. You can and you can follow a lot of paths, you know, as as you go along your road, you take a lot of side routes and some of them pan out and some of them don't. So you can spend months looking into something that you kind of have to say, okay, well, I'm not going to be able to work with this. I did that a lot in the beginning because I was looking into things like, you know, the MJ-12 documents and the Bob Lazar story and all these things that were intriguing to me. But to do the kind of reporting that I wanted to do, these were not the kinds of things that I could work with because they they did they weren't corroborated. So, you know, I, I, I just had to kind of go through a process of elimination like that um, and really figure out what could I really report on? Because I was trying to reach the main, a mainstream audience, you know, that doesn't know anything about this and trying to really break through this ridicule factor. So I had to be, get really, really good material. And like the second story I did was, was um, based on a report by Richard Haynes from NARCAP, who maybe some listeners will remember. Um, and it was all about aviation safety cases. And, you know, that was something, I mean, it was really powerful because it was all these cases of pilots interacting with these objects and they were all on the record and nobody could argue with it. And how can you say, well, this doesn't matter when these these events are occurring, you know, with and this is mainly commercial aircraft, you know, passenger planes. So those are the kinds of things that I had to focus on. I couldn't go off into sort of this really strange stuff too much. How do you, what, what's on your business card? How do you define yourself, a, a journalist, an author, a researcher? How do you look at yourself? I mean, if I had to pick one word, <clears throat> sorry, it, I would be, it would be investigative journalist, I think. It, yeah. And it, it, is there a difference in the research for an article as opposed to writing a book? And, 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 and of course, there must be a difference in the writing style, but is there a difference in the research and how you approach it? I mean, it depends on, of course, what the book is and what it's about. I mean, when I did the UFO book in 2010, it really, it was kind of like an expand, it wasn't that different. It was like an expanded article, although I could bring more of myself into it in a book, right? Because, you know, I, I wrote an introduction all about how I got started. And then at the end, I sort of wrote my a kind of a broader philosophical commentary on, you know, what I think it might mean and what, you know, so it becomes more personal in a book. Um, and more detailed, a lot more detail. I mean, you can do so much more in a book than in, in a short article. And then my book, Surviving Death, was really personal. And it was much more of a risk for me to write that book than it was to write UFOs. So I, that's what I like about writing a book, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me ask you about that because so much is out there. Uh, it, it's like there's two different, certainly today too. Uh, let me get this thought out. Uh, we have like two different sides to the question. We have the civilian side and and the testimony. Um, Bud Hopkins is a great example of that, right? Of course, and and John Mack, and then you have the uh, the military and and the governmental side of it. Um, your focus uh, uh, for everybody has been on the other side, right? Uh, uh, um, the geopolitical side, the defensive side, and and the military side. Is that because of your pragmatic mind where you, you, you want to just deal with those types of facts? Yeah, I mean, it was really, if we look pre-2017, Jimmy, my goal was to try to get the U.S. government to pay attention to this and to get the you know, the establishment, the status quo to pay attention to this, the members of Congress, the media. And the, the only way I could do that was to bring super credible information to the table, because at that point, this thing was totally ridiculed, this subject matter. So I had to write about, you know, military people, airline, air pilots, um, you know, things like that. If I started writing about 
average people who are reporting these really bizarre encounters with aliens, forget it. That would, the members of Congress aren't going to pay attention to that. It was all about, it was all kind of a strategic effort to get the kinds of attention to this that I felt it deserved. You know, every time I wrote an article, I thought, write something that you could, you felt you could put on the desk of a member of Congress and they would read it. So, you know, if you're putting out press, I remember, you know, there were activists putting out press releases at the time all about extraterrestrials and that 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 just had the opposite effect. It made them actually turn away from this. So I actually worked with a public relations firm in, the, in my early years in in, in um, Washington. That's how I met John Podesta. And I, I was you know, I learned from those people how you can approach members of Congress. What kind of information will they pay attention to? What kind of information is going to turn them off? And so I, I was really trying to focus on, you know, what was going to create change in that in that world. And that's why I stuck with that kind of information. And then in, in 2017, it was that kind of information that broke everything open when we went to the New York Times. So the um, the approach when you go and have conversations uh, south of the border, right? Uh, whether it's it's Mexico or cent Central America on into you know uh, uh, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, what have you. Um, it, is it easy to start that conversation and open those doors as opposed to Washington? It's really different. I mean, the, the main place that I spent time was Chile. And, and I got to be very kind of, I mean, they invited me into their government agency and I sat in on meetings and I got to spend time there and they showed me their files and, and they just didn't have the kind of um, paranoid, you know, secrecy going on like they do here. I mean, they were open about pretty much everything. Uh, it was part of the mandate of that government agency was to be transparent. And it's a smaller country. You know, it's not, you're not dealing with the United States of America, which is so different. But that, I, you know, I was very friendly with the people at that agency. So that was not difficult for me. I haven't spent a lot of time in any other countries. I think it was through the Chilean authorities that I was introduced to some of the officials from some of the other countries. Um, and uh, there was a general from Brazil who wrote a chapter in my book and some others from Chile. So, but it was really fascinating for me to spend time with that, that agency and see how they operated. And I kind of saw that as a model, a s smaller version of a model for how a, an agency could function at a very low budget. And I remember bringing that knowledge back with me. And I also spent time with Japan, in France, the French agency. And those two agencies sort of, I felt were models for what could potentially happen in the United States. And I was, I, you know, I did a lot of investigation and I spent time with them. Then I brought this information back and I had meetings with John Podesta about it. You know, we need to get something going here. Um, and of course, it, it turned out there already was an agency here, but it was top secret and it was only dealing with a limited type of case, only with military cases. So yeah, so it was very useful to see that the Chilean agency could do what it was doing without a big budget because it relied on advisors and, and you know, scientists and all these people, meteorologists that would can come and contribute to case investigations. And they, it wouldn't cost them anything. They just relied on all these officials from, from outside of the agency to, to contribute and they would. Everybody cared. Everybody was interested in it. Was there ever a chatter? Um, uh, I'm just reminded of James Fox and his new movie, right? Uh, Moment of Contact. And you've known James forever. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, in, in that, in, in your communications with, with Chile um, and, and, and the general from Brazil too as well, that the road always ends with I, it's the rumor in the UFO community, right? It, that the United States steps in, there's, there's a crash or there's contact or there's evidence or there's a thing. And those governments and, and militaries take things as far as they can until that moment of contact with the United States right. government. Um, did, did, does this stuff actually occur or is there an independence there? The reason why I'm asking such a direct question is because of uh, uh, a tip or other things that may have been going on uh, at the Pentagon prior. And were they sharing this information back and forth? Yeah. I mean, I don't know because I, if something like that happened in Chile, I don't know if I would have been, if I would know about it. 
I mean, I don't know what I don't know. I certainly didn't get the impression that the U.S. played a big role in the work that they were doing on this issue. Um, they certainly, you know, I mean, I was the, the only person they really talked to. And then they were dealing with NARCAP also. They had a relationship with Richard Haynes and Ted Rowe from NARCAP. Mm -hmm. But we were, they weren't give, dealing, but those were not government officials. And I wasn't, a they weren't dealing with anybody really from the United States government out of this agency in Chile. Now, it may be that at very, very high levels of the Chilean Air Force, something else was going on, you know. Sure. And if there had been a crash there or something, it might have been handled in the way you're describing. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised at all. But as far as the agency itself knew, and it was run by a general, his name is General Bermudez. Um, they were not interacting with the Americans and they were completely on their own doing what they were doing. So who knows what goes on, though, that you don't know about. There was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, um, well, it, it, with uh, with James in the new film, uh, I, the, you know, I'm going to include myself in this. I, I don't like to I inject my opinions, but when you get to that part of the film where everything is trying to get resolved, it, it, it the ending is the United States comes in and, and brings a plane down and carts off everything and the, and the body and. And we don't know the end of the story now, you know, uh, you know, from James Fox. And I think that a lot of us, including myself, go, man, yeah, man, you know, it's always that. <laughs> it's always it's that. It's so frustrating. I know. Yeah. But, you know, the end of the story is has not arrived, but James is still working on it. So yeah. I hope there'll be more to come on that. It's just a really, really hard one to unravel. But yeah, I mean, I have no doubt that the Americans came in on that. In fact, I've had that confirmed for me by sources here in America that that indeed did happen. The Americans jumped in and grabbed the stuff. And so we it's somewhere sitting somewhere in America and we don't know anything about it. Now, let's go back again. Let's t turn back a couple of pages. I want to talk about Belgium and, mm -hmm. um, you know, going back to like UFO 101 when uh, you start looking at the history of, of this subject, one, one place stands out that two years in Belgium was an absolutely incredible ride. And your research into that, um, uh, it, it, it's so complete. Um, well, incomplete too as well, because it's always incomplete. But um, it's, uh, it's an amount of work that you put into that, that I invite anybody to go when we're talking about Belgium to go and, and look at Leslie's research there. When you found out about Belgium, as you know, because this was, uh, you said 1999 when you got the Comita report. Yeah. Yeah. Bel Belgium, that was a huge, huge deal. Do you remember when that was actually going off in the media originally? I don't. I don't remember that. I mean, maybe the Hudson Valley wave, which was a few years before that, there were, but there was barely any media coverage of that. It was pathetic how little there was. I mean, I, I think I maybe remember one or two little taut, tiny stories, but no, I didn't remember anything about Belgium in the American media. No, I, I just saw, I learned all about that later when I was writing my book and got to meet, you know, Wilfried de Brouwer, who was the major player in that. And just so people know, he actually wrote the, ch the chapter you're talking about with all this great research. Well, he actually wrote that chapter, not me. So one of the well, reasons I think my book is, is interesting is because I invited like 17, I think it was 17 other people to contribute chapters besides me. So you're not, you're hearing from these generals and these high level people in their, you're hearing directly from them in their own words. And I thought I really love doing that. I liked for him to, be, I mean, I wrote a chapter on the Belgian wave also. But I love the fact that you get to read his words and he was directly involved and, you, and he has his own nuance and his own way of, of portraying it that I find really fascinating. So, yeah, I love that. It's one thing I, re I can say I love about my book is the chapters written by all these different people. They're different styles. They're different experiences. You know, the pilot who almost sh tried to shoot down the UFO over Iran. I figured, like, why should I tell you what he said and give little quotes? Why not just let him tell the story? So that's what I did. Yeah. See, I read in your voice. That's what I, read. Uh, <laughs> I think you forget. I think some people forget when they're reading a chapter by someone else that it's actually written by someone else. Uh, I, the, I, it, the, um, and staying on Belgium for a second, sure. it, it, it was 
um, it was a, it was a case as as you started to find out for sure that had all of the elements. You had civilian and local law enforcement on the ground with their sightings. Um, you had multiple sightings at the same time that were confirmed. Uh, the 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 civilian uh, non military radio chatter with you know sending things out to the sightings in the sky uh, all the way through to pilots and scrambled jets and radar data and press conferences and and colonels and generals going on the record. It was a hysteria. It was a fantastic, uh, it was such a, I encourage everyone to look into that. It's so fascinating. Yeah. And what was amazing to me about it was the difference in the way that was handled versus the way the Hudson Valley wave was handled, which was a very similar, it just happened five years earlier, four years earlier. And I, I, it just was so interesting to me to compare and con contrast, really. That was handled completely openly. The Air Force was asked to, to get, you know, to get involved and try to figure out what these things were. And they, they worked with the scientific community directly. They, they gathered volumes. I, I went and saw these volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of hard copy data that they collected all in cooperation with scientists and government. I mean, back in the those days, you know, it was pre 2017, that just kind of thing never happened here. And when the Hudson Valley way was happening, it was just, nobody paid any attention to it. It was just like ignored. Um, and people didn't know what to do. They didn't know who to turn to with reports. Uh, it was just really shocking. You know, Al J. Allen Hallett wrote this essay about the, that right before he died, which I find to be one of the most compelling things I've ever read, where he just expresses his utter astonishment at, at the dereliction of duty, that he, as he calls it, that, that went on during that Hudson Valley wave. He was trying to understand what was going on in the mindset of these authorities who completely ignored this absolutely extraordinary thing that was happening in their backyard, right? It was just like it didn't exist. And um, yeah, you had thousands, thousands of witnesses pulling over on the freeway, right? Exactly. And um, what is fascinating about Hudson Valley and, and, and Belgium, if those events went down today, it would have been oh, totally, totally a different story. Absolutely. I, I really agree with you. And I, same thing about the O'Hare incident of 2006, which is really that and Stephenville are sort of the most recent really good cases we've had, I think, prior to, to Nimitz. Or, yeah, I guess they were after Nimitz, but we didn't hear about Nimitz until later. So, you know, imagine if there was a disc hovering over an airport now for five minutes over over the gate, you know, not that high up. I would be a big it, it's not it, they can't do this anymore. We, we're in a new world now. So and that's that's a really great thing. I mean, so I, hope, I wish yeah. Yeah, I hope they come back with another wave for us. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I, I mean, it goes without saying. But could you imagine a live stream on Facebook of O'Hare? Right. Whoa. Yeah. I mean, it just it wouldn't it would not have be treated the way it was. It just, they couldn't get away with it, treating it the way they did then. Um, uh, just, and, and 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 stay. I, I want to stay on Belgium for a second sure. uh, because there was when when those press conferences started. Um, I don't think. I mean, going back to General Stanford, right? I mean, when was the last time we had a press conference like that? where evidence was what the Iraq invasion, right? I don't know, um, uh, where you had military officials uh, in front of the press running a television screen uh, with gun camera footage. I mean, that was crazy town. Yeah, I mean, he was up. I remember General DeBrower was up, and he had these, these uh, radar, you know, signatures that he was showing to everybody in a packed press room. And he was explaining what data they had. Like, there's nothing secret about it. <laughs> when, when we go back and, and talk about Belgium, do you think there is a possibility that that may have been our craft being test flown? I mean, I think that's always a possibility. I have to. Yeah, I do. I mean, as far as General de Brouwer, I mean, he was a colonel at the time, but he spoke to the NATO, NATO allies. He spoke to high-level officials in the United States. He personally was convinced it was not uh, U.S. technology. 
uh, and he was essentially told that, but that doesn't mean, you know, maybe it was because if it was, I'm not sure we would just go tell General De Brower that it was, you know. So I think we always have to keep that as a possibility. I mean, I, 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 I don't know what kind of secret technology we might have. I suspect it's we have more than any of us are aware of. So it was recent enough, I suppose, that, you know, it was still a while ago. But the people who saw it certainly could never even imagine that it could be te our technology. But I, I well, live, I live, um, uh, well, full disclosure, I live about a mile and a half from Skunk Works, right? I'm out here in the desert in Palmdale. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, right? This is where it goes down. This is where it's right. always gone down. And there is stuff, right? There just is. And the the suggestion that what we see now, well, what we're working on is 50 years in the future, right? And we're seeing stuff um, that was developed 50 years ago, this modern technology that we're seeing today. And I would say in a general sense, that is true. But that doesn't take care of, you know, the TR3B or black uh, triangles or the Tic Tac or anti-gravity or, or defying physics unless we are, what, a thousand years in the future? And I don't think that's where it is. Yeah, I mean, I just don't know. I'm really not in a position to know what technology goes with how many years in the future. But I just think, you know, we have to keep that as a, po I mean, that's probably the only other possible explanation for those those objects that were over Belgium, but the speed at which they could take off, um, you know, the, the way they describe, you know, these silent hovering triangles, and then in a blink of an eye, they're just like gone like that. Right. Certainly they couldn't have any uh, creature, any living creatures inside of them, you wouldn't think, that could survive that kind of acceleration. So I don't know. I mean, it doesn't sound like it was our technology from what they describe, but I think you just never know 100%. You got to leave that possibility open. As a journalist, um, and you you take a look at the you know, we're we're in the middle of some pretty crazy hysteria right now, and when you look at this, and you are asked all the time, "Well, what's the deal? Is it ET? Is it UFOs? Are they real? Are they actually visiting us?" You've answered that question so many times, but how do you feel personally about the phenomenon now? And, and has it fundamentally changed uh, over the last 20, 30 years? Well, I mean, the basic way I think it's changed for me is that I recognize there's a lot more complexity to it than I originally thought. Um, how so? Well, I mean, back in the day when I was writing and then at the time of my book, the sort of going theory at that time was the extraterrestrial hypothesis, just like the generals and the people in the commander report had said in, in 1999. And that's what, to the extent that any of the people who contributed to my book were willing to say what they thought it was, they always said it that way, which really meant visitors from some other solar system or some other part of the galaxy traveling in spaceships to get here. That's how they were thinking of it. And, and you know, now uh, I don't think of the phenomenon as being anywhere near that simple. I mean, I don't think we know, you know, it's got, it's just, it's, as everyone talks about, it's, you can't just label it that simply, right? It's got, it could be interdimensional. It could be uh, ultra terrestrial. It could be, some could be some things and some could be something else. It has all these paranormal aspects to it. It's just this, and it seems to get more and more hard to pin down the more we learn about it. So I'm much more sort of, I think that, you know, Jacques Vallée was sort of ahead of everyone on that. You know, I'm much more in that camp now of seeing it through a much broader lens than I used to see it. Um, and yeah, the, so that's the main difference. Uh, let, me, let me jump in and ask you why. And, and the reason for such a general question when I say why, is it because of the size of our Milky Way? It's ginormous, right? And the amount of exoplanets. And then you go beyond that and the size of the universe that it may not just be one single species, some ex advanced extraterrestrial civilization visiting us. It could be thousands. And they could just do a drive-by once and then we're seeing something else the next time. That's why things don't line up case after case. Could be. I mean, I, I just don't know. And it's very mysterious, the variety of 
you know, objects and, and reports that we have of different types of creatures and all of that. I don't know. I mean, it's also possible that there have been, uh, you know, beings. I mean, I think there have been beings here long before we ever got here. Or certainly that, that go back way, way back in history. There have been visitors from somewhere else who maybe have decided to come stay here. And then we came after that. I mean, it's so complicated. Um, and I think it's not some, I think it's more that more has, there's been more knowledge. There's been more that's come out about the sort of stranger aspects of the, of the UFO phenomenon, such as the, the skinwalkers at the Pentagon book, for instance, you know, there's so much more data now showing these sort of biz more bizarre elements of it that are, you just can't pin down to, oh, they're visitors from some other planet. It's just, you know, it's impossible to, to box it in like that. Is it um, because we've just reached our ceiling of being able to understand certain things? Right? <laughs> we've just, I feel that way sometimes. I feel like I, I'll probably never understand what this is. I mean, maybe maybe we're not capable of understanding. I know Jim Semivan has made some really interesting comments along those lines. You know, it, that I, it, maybe the human being will never understand it. Uh, and we just can't, and maybe we're not meant to, or maybe it's, it's, you know, you can also think of it, maybe the, it's up to the phenomenon itself, whatever, or whoever it is, how much we're going to be understanding it. What, you know, how much are they going to yeah. reveal to us? That's yeah, up to them. And not to go like, uh, some intangible existential situation here, but if we just go with black and white, and if we, jumped in a time machine and went back 50,000 years and we're dealing with homo sapien sapien back then about these basic things that we're talking about right they would have abs their, their their knowledge ceiling is way off kilter as to what they could understand maybe that's where we are today i mean just what how far how much can we understand the future will be different but right now we're having trouble with it, and it's only because we are who we are. Yeah. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, 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 it, and this is why I agree with everything that you just said. If I think about what I used to think about, you know, the, the, uh, the, the hypothesis, generally speaking, I think we were all there. Metal mm -hmm. ship, little dude. Exactly. At, at the at the controls, rivets, right? <laughs> Cruising across the universe for uh, some crazy length of time and arriving here. I right. am so far away from that now. Although well, I think everyone is. You know, I think the understanding has really expanded, and and to what? Yeah, we we're, it's just something way more than that. Way more difficult to understand. With a lot more complexity and different dimensions to it than something like that. Um, and so, you know, it, it just makes it harder and harder to pin it down. When, um, when you started to get exposed to all of the information back in, in 2017, leading up to uh, the article in December mm -hmm. uh, with you and Ralph, um, this starts to open up those doors where, um, the suggestions from Jacques or or others um, certainly come into play because the physics behind the Tic Tac, as described by by David Fravor, absolutely made no sense. That and and coming up to that, we never really talked about UFOs in in those terms. How did you start to deal with that? You mean with the that case in particular? Yes. Or, yes. Yeah, I mean, I I was stunned by that case. It was, you know, I, I, we, we actually included a section in the New York times story just about that case, but it was only the, you know, it was, it didn't include all of it by a long shot, but um, I think it, I think it was the first time that Dave Fravor had come forward. I'm not sure, but um, I remember meeting him when I went with Helene Cooper, the, the reporter from the times and we had dinner with him in DC for like in just hours listening to him tell that story, she was absolutely blown away because she was new to all of this. So, um, yeah, I mean, all the data that that case has is really extraordinary and the behavior of the object, as you point out. And, you know. And, and which, can, can we stay right here for a second? Yeah. 
Um, going up to that point when you're uh, you're writing, you're researching, uh, you know, going back to Comida or or Belgium and and the content of on the record uh, UFOs. <laughs> you call okay. it UFOs. call it on the record. That's good. Uh, on the record, um, th- th- everything was uh, described by witnesses and military and everything else in a certain way. And now we've got hardcore science fiction going on. This is like way new stuff. And if you're going to write about it, the public has to understand it uh, along with you and, and your friend getting exposed to this for the first time like that. That's kind of your barometer, um, you know, the way that the public would look at this too, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really think what you said is right on, that it's 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 more like science fiction now. And in fact, one of the early briefing slides from the ATIP program that I saw said that, um, you know, it was a little little blurb they had at the bottom of the briefing site it said science fiction is now science fact and this was like 10 years ago i think that's sort of that sort of sums it up i mean i guess you could say that the notion of extraterrestrial travelers and metal spaceships is also like science fiction but not in the same way that w- of what we're dealing with now just because of all the components of this phenomenon that have come out right i mean and that includes the kind of things that occurred at Skinwalker Ranch and people's consciousness being affected by sightings, Uh, you know, different changes that go on in people after they have events like this, all the close encounter events and how, you know, there's a whole mixture, a conglomeration of of phenomena that make up the UAP. Um, And it's not simple at all. So it is kind of more science fiction-y. The more we learn, the weirder it gets. Are you still in in contact with uh, your your military friends from around the world? Yeah, I mean, not as it depends who, but not as much as I was p- before 2017. I've been, uh, you know, yeah, not quite as much, but it depends who you're talking about. the The reason why I, I ask is the the tic tac. And, and things like that, and certainly we can go East Coast, West Coast, you know, Roosevelt, what have you, but can't only be the United States Navy, right? It, it, this is a global phenomenon. Wouldn't this be happening with navies of South America or Australia or, or Russia or China, uh, Great Britain? Are there other reports of, of, of tic tac events going on? I mean, I, I don't, not that I can really think of post 2017. No, I mean, and of course, if they went on in Russia or China, we might not know about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I haven't heard of any from South America that are quite like that. Um, it's an interesting question. Yeah. So, well, you know, in, your opinion, in your opinion, why maybe it's U.S. technology. Right. Okay. So I guess you answered my question in your yeah. opinion. Uh, why? Why only the United States Navy and and not even our Air Force? Right? It seems to well, be. Well, it seems like it's kind of a one-off event. There's been no no tic tac since, and and there were some earlier reports of the of tic tac like objects, like in the 50s and 60s. I remember Lou Elizondo had these really interesting documents referencing one that described it, I think, like a butane tank or something. Another one, you know, they described it in ways of. So there, there have been similar shaped objects. Whether they were behaving the same way as the one in 2004, I'm not sure. So, um, yeah, it's not like this has been a recurring thing the way the way triangles are or disc shapes objects, you know, that people see a lot. So who knows why that is? Um, you know, you have to keep open the possibility that maybe it was some some incredibly advanced technology being t- tested or there, something like that, but. Nobody who was there thought that was the case. The way I had uh, Ryan Graves on last week, and yeah. uh, and he's great. He's just yeah. he's great. And in speaking with him, I, I can't help but ask the question that's on everybody's mind. It just can't be uh, just off of our shores that every, every military in the world must be dealing with this uh, in their own way. It just can't be just us. Well, I, I, I think they are all dealing with it. I mean, is there any reason to think that they're not? Exactly. I think they probably are. I what to what extent we would know about it, I'm not sure. You know, I mean every country has their own way of dealing with it. And certainly our adversaries are not going to broadcast it. 
to how, us, you know? And how do you, uh, with all of this crashing down on the world so quickly, um, the, the impact of, of your article with Ralph back in 2017, I don't think it could be measured, right? The impact was, was, was broad and, uh, very, very serious, but the world didn't implode either. Right. Uh, everybody right. took it pretty well. Were you surprised about that? That, that the world didn't implode? Yes. <laughs> the, you know, and, well, you know, you said Comita, but if you go to the Condon report or you, you know, the Rand Corporation or the Robertson Committee, you, you look at all of the professional analysis on what would happen to humanity if this reveal happened. Um, well, none of that happened in December of 2017. I think the world took it pretty well. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're thinking about like people freaking out if they sort of get it that UFOs are real, I mean, I think the key there is that that there's got to be a gradual unfolding of information, and um, it you know it's been fairly grad. I mean, that was just saying, well, there's this agency, there's this department in the DoD that's been studying this for a while, and uh, here's some videos, you know, and Harry Reid says they're really important. He he got the money for it and. Lou Elizondo feels there needs to be more resources for it. So he resigned, you know, so it's, that was sort of like, wow, the government's been studying it and they've even given us some videos here. And then the next step was kind of like, you know, finally our government itself acknowledged that yes, they're real, but you know, it's happened in steps and the Navy says, okay, we need better reporting methods. Then we get the 2021 report where they really do say these, uh, these things are real. I mean, that was a real statement. They said that they're real. We don't have evidence that they're ours. We don't have evidence that they're Russian or Chinese. You know, no data showing us that. So it's been this sort of gradual step, stepping thing, stepping stones from 2017. And then recently we've got the U.S. Congress asking for reports about crash retrievals. I mean, it, we've really come, it's been five years. But so I don't think it was like everything was dumped on the world at once. I think maybe if everything was dumped at once, there'd be a little more of a reaction like you're talking about. But I yeah, why do you think why do you think the reaction was so was subdued? Um, uh, that I, I I was driving in my car uh -huh. and I'm listening to KFI, the radio station that I broadcast on, right, and in Los Angeles, the big talk radio station. So it's always on in my car. I'm just right. driving. The government says UFOs are real. We'll tell you all about it after the break. I was like, Wah! yeah, <laughs> what? Is that what they said in 2017. Yeah, but, yeah. So I mean, good. it was a big deal. I, I think, I think it was. I mean, I remember the reaction of that article was absolutely huge all over the world. So it really was. A, there was a huge reaction to it. But subdued. I, I mean, the reaction I don't was know if I subdued, but I don't know. Uh, I, but uh, no, I, I, what I'm trying to uh, express is when I would talk to right after that, yeah, and I would talk to people outside of the UFO game, right? Just friends or family or whatever. Yeah. Of course, there's aliens visiting <laughs> us. I think, you know, the universe is just too big. It was like a strange. I thought that I was going to get something. Whoa! Are you kidding me? No, I didn't get that at all. It was very. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. It's true. Uh, I mean, for us who are interested in it, it's the biggest deal in the world, right? Because we're finally getting acknowledgement. But yeah, for people who don't care, it probably wasn't a big deal. And those are, we forget that that's the majority of the people out there. Uh, I just think the majority of the people out there, they're, they might think it's sort of fun, but they don't really care that much about UFOs. So it's not going to affect them very much. I think that's the point you're making. We we live in this bubble of people who really care, and for us, the the littlest thing we get from our government is like the biggest deal. Yeah, but for the average person out there, they don't care. They don't know. They don't care. They just want to, you know, live their daily lives and take care of their families. And how not, is how is the New York Times uh, uh, attitude about this today? Is it still the same? Are they still pursuing this? Um, and and I'm asking because of uh, so many significant things happened in the media, and certainly centered around you, like New Yorker, and 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 that that great piece uh, that was written. Um, are, are 
are they still open to this? Is it something that is the foot still on the gas? Well, I don't. I, I think I'd have to leave that up to the people who read the New York Times reporting that's been coming out in the last. You know, I mean, the last story Ralph and I did was in July of 2021, and that was about the crash retrieval scenario. Um, oh no! And then we we did a story too about the hearings in May last the May uh, congressional hearings. But um, there's been you know there's been some reporting in the New York Times since then by others uh, that are on staff there, and I'm not going to comment on them. I think it's up to people who read them to decide mm-hmm. where they think the New York Times is at. Um, Ralph and I are freelancers, so we have to you know, we have to bring a story to them and say, hey, we've got this exclusive and it's got to be something really special for them to run our story. It's very difficult for us to get a story into the Times. So until we bring them our next story, it's hard for me to know what they're, you know, if they've changed their position or not. They've always been open to our contributing stories if they're really spectacular. Uh, They're not going to, you know, they're not. And so for the less spectacular ones, they just hire, they just have one of their staff on it. And maybe their staff don't have the, uh, the knowledge about the topic, have very much knowledge about the topic, or maybe they have an agenda or, you know, they, they take a particular angle. And I don't know how much of that is the position of the paper or how much it's just the person who writes the story. I mean, I'm not on the inside of the New York times because I'm a freelancer. I'm on the outside. And so I only really get to know what everyone else gets to know who reads it, who reads what they put out. And I just hope that Ralph and I are going to be able to continue to report for them when we get a story that will, you know, is the kind of story that we can get to our editors there. We're trying to do that. We're always following up on things and and trying to get to the next story. So time will tell. In in your last article, and I talked to Ralph about this, uh, maybe you listened to it. But in that article about crash retrievals, which was great, right? But the the hidden gem in that was buried, right? Down, 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 the end. down, down, down. Yeah. Down. <laughs> I'm just reading along, and then and then I get to it, right? The the right. Doctor Eric Davis uh, quote attributed to him um, that he uh, briefed. Uh, in a classified setting uh, to the Senate that dudes, we've got flying saucers, right? <laughs> and so yeah, I'm, I'm really didn't say it quite like that, but actually to staffers, it wasn't to the actual centers, to staffers. No, yeah. Right. Right. And I, I read that. I went, wait a minute. This, this, and Holy crap. Right. right. I, I, whoa. I agree what? with you. That was a, that was an amazing little piece of dynamite buried in that story. And if, if, you know, as far as Ralph and I were concerned, that was the, that was the headline of the article. That was the headline. Why, why but, down? Why, why, why down? And why not lead off with that? That was not our, uh, up to us. Oh. That was, there's a lot of editorial control when you write a story about UFOs for the New York Times. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say too much about it, but it, we don't always get to choose the order in which things appear in a story. What's important, what isn't important, how much information we can include about this as opposed to that. Uh, you know, there's well, there's okay. a lot of other people involved in writing in, in ha- that have the ultimate say. And we have to, you have to, you bargain. I mean, you, you request certain things and you, you, um, you know, try to, you, you pick your battles and you really insist right. on some things and you let go of other things. But, um, yeah, that was that was the way the article was structured. Uh, well, and, and here's here's what people do. This is the mindset. So you read the article, and you get to that gem, that piece of dynamite, as as you describe it. Mm-hmm. You get to that, and then uh, it's it's journalism one hundred and one. You're taught this in school first week in in class, right? It, it, you vet your you vet your sources three times. Right. You vet your sources three times. You vet your, and so if the New York Times has included this in this article, this bombshell uh, reference in there, then for it to make it to print, they deemed it solid and okay. Am I correct in saying it that way? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. They're very careful about what they print. And Eric Davis is a, is a highly reputable, highly credible person. And so they were willing to accept him and that at that level at face value and put his quote in there. And Lou Elizondo also had been in previous stories we'd written. So he contributed to that dialogue too about the materials. Um, so yeah, it, I mean, we were amazed that they would do it. We And you know, it's always, I remember there's a frustration that there wasn't more about that topic in the story because Ralph and I certainly had more information, but uh, it's it's not up to us. And I think people have to realize if they're disappointed, they have to realize the battle that we had to fight just to get in there what we got. Um, and that was the situation. This was the most difficult story of all the ones we did uh, because of it, you know, because of the nature of what we're talking about, cr crash retrievals, right? So we did the absolute best we could, but, and we were happy with what we got, even though, of course, we'd always wish we could have done more with it. You're but. giving other journalists out there, investigative reporters, you're giving them the golden egg, right? You're giving them that. Why from another organization or another uh, writer uh, follow up and, and jumping on that comment? Did you get phone calls about it? Did no, I mean, that is such a good question, Jimmy, because Ralph and I were freelancers, right? But somebody on the staff of like the Washington Post could go places yeah. that we can't go as freelancers. And it's like, why don't they? Why? Do, I mean, I remember feeling that way when I wrote my story in 2000, right? How many years ago? More than 20 years ago about this Cometa report. I was just waiting for everybody to jump on it and for like, you know, Seymour Hirsch or someone like that to grab it who actually works for a publication and can open doors that I could never open as, a, as an independent or freelance journalist, you know, and nothing happened. And it's the same thing with that. I think it's just such a great point. Like, why don't these journalists who have this inside track that I don't have jump all over this? And they don't. Why hasn't anybody reported about this new NDAA? that's asking for reports on crash retrievals and, and mentions reverse engineering. I mean, nobody's covering that. And, you know, I don't have the ability to do it for the New York Times, or I would. So it's really an interesting question about why. And, you know, the media goes through waves, too. Remember in, around in spring of 2021, right before that report came out, there was like a frenzy in the media, right? That's when 60 Minutes did their show. That's when the New Yorker piece came out. It was, you know, everybody in the media was on this topic. And then the report came out and there was barely any coverage of the report. All the coverage was in anticipation of it. And then it just stopped. So I don't know, it goes through these frenzied moments, but there's nobody that's really on it, really digging, except, you know, there's people like Ross Coulthard is amazing. But from these mainstream established media outlets like the Washington Post, say, or places like that, or some of the networks like NBC. I mean, you don't have somebody that just staying on this and really trying to pick up on it. And I don't, I don't know why, really, if it were me, I'd want to do it. It's a gift. You gave, you gave everybody the tools. You gave them the gift. I did, um, I had a sighting. This is many, many years ago. I'm not going to waste time on it. But I had this incredible sighting and I go, um, I'm hosting coast to coast. Right. And, and I, I go public with it and I tell the whole thing. Think about the size of that audience, Leslie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I expected, I expected, I really did. I thought somebody, CNN, Fox, uh, ABC, yeah. NBC, BBC, somebody would reach out going, what did you say? What happened? Crickets. I just, right. I, I just don't get it. You give somebody a gift like that, and um, I, you know, I've just given up. And like your, your little drop in that article, I just thought to myself, "Here we go. This is going to be great. All right, You're let's, lonely, let's right? circle the wagons. Nothing. Yeah, just that's right. Just to me. Absolutely right. Let's but, take. Yeah, you know, but the Congress did write their their legislation, so maybe that had maybe it somehow was you know contributed towards that. I have no idea, but at least now it's it's in the discussion. It's part of the narrative. So, let's take our break right progress. here. 
Okay. We'll be right back more with Leslie after this short break. I'm Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below. And we'll be right back. Check out Billy Carson's Forbidden Knowledge. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv where you can get access to over 6,000 videos, movies, TV series, exclusive documentaries like the Black Knight Satellite. You can do it all for just $7.77 per month or $77 per year after the three-day trial, which is also totally free to check out. It's all simple to do. Billy Carson is the best. It's simple. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv TV. That's the number four, four BK. I will be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton right here in Los Angeles, California. 200 speakers, including Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, George Norrie, Daniel Sheehan, Scott Walter Shonstone, and David Wolf. Over 200 vendors, special events. This is the biggest event of its kind on planet Earth. You've got to come and hang out with all of us. Tickets and info at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. The links are below. On Saturday, April 1st, that's right, April Fool's Day, 2023, I will be hosting the Parapod Festival at the Hyatt Regency right here in Valencia, California. It's a live, one-day podcast awards. It's a film festival. It's a full-on media event. We're going to have sky watching. There's going to be a Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Linda Moulton Howe. Right now, you can submit your podcast, your film, your TV series, any of your paranormal media for consideration. You can do all of that on the links below. For info and tickets, go to parapodfilmfest.com. That's parapodfilmfest.com. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right. Up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit DivineTravels.com forward slash Hidden Secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com all right welcome back fade to black i'm your host jimmy church tonight our guest leslie kane and I, my goal has been completed the life and times of leslie and and what makes her tick and the the deal is this um we started off the show uh tonight leslie with you know, what have you been up to? Um, Can you confirm or deny uh, the chatter going around about a new series uh, coming out that you're, you've contributed to? Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, I can confirm. In fact, I've already posted it on my Facebook page. Um, But so this is the series that was supposed to be, was actually made for CNN. And I was a producer on that along with the my my team at Breakthrough Films, which is a production company that I've worked with on many projects, and anyway, so it's not going to be on CNN, but it's a five it's a five part series, um, and it's going to be on National Geographic, Nat Geo on I think it's February thirteenth is the initial two episodes, and then the day after it goes on Hulu, so I think most people will probably want to watch it on Hulu. I don't know, I. I don't watch cable television and turn it on at nine o'clock at night to watch something, you know, but it's, that's, so it's, it's two episodes on, on Monday, the 13th, and then two episodes the following Monday, and then the final episode the following Monday. And then, so that means by the end of that two week period, the whole thing will be on Hulu for streaming. So, 
and and how is um uh you know i've got my own series um it, my, my stuff is on gaia so i'm it's it's a little bit more what's the word i want to use i i've got control right and 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 things it's a, it's a different way to approach things mm-hmm. how is uh, uh network television today starting to approach this programming is has it changed for you do you think that there's a different way of looking at things um uh, I'm not sure exactly what, what, if I understand your question, Jimmy, um, well, different uh, as opposed to like, maybe you being less of a taboo. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you know, the, the X files music and, and that attitude right. to the boardroom. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely changed. Um, and this is, this series certainly is totally serious. There's none of that silly stuff at all. I would never participate in something that was like that. So this is sort of a CNN style kind of news, you know, it's, it's just, it's really exciting. And it's, um, you know, they, I think it's very well done and it's designed for people who don't know a lot about this. So it was designed to reach, you know, the millions of in the CNN audience who don't know anything about this, but it's going to be part of their documentary programming that they'd have, they have something every Sunday night, but anyway, it didn't work out because CNN, they kind of, uh, shuttered i mean they just kind of collapsed when there was this merger over the summer and this whole documentary department and was in cnn just shut down and we almost lost the series altogether unfortunately it went over to vice actually picked it up and it went over to this this it, it's disney plus vice and that geo they're all part of one right entity. yeah so it's see- also going to have a run on vice and it's going to end up on disney plus eventually Um, so it's going to get a lot of exposure this year, but yeah, it's a very serious and it's got great people in it and revisit some old cases and look at them through new eyes and, you know, talk about the behind the scenes at the 2017 New York times story. And then there's stuff about Stephenville and there's stuff about, um, you know, we have James in there and we go back to the press conference, James and I did in 2007. There's a lot of looking back, but there's also a lot of post 2017 coverage too. Um, and we talk about MUFON and some of the citizen groups that were really prevalent after Blue Book shut down and, you know, got great interviews with a lot of incredible people. So I think I think everyone's going to enjoy it. So, well, you know, I subscribe. I don't have cable TV either. Uh, right. Yeah, I, I, if you're I, on I, Hulu, you can watch it there. I have Hulu. I have Nat Geo. You know, it's so yeah. funny. I, I, I cut the tie like everybody does, right? So you cut the ties, right? No more cable. And then you go and subscribe and you're spending three times the money that you were doing before. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's to like, all these other streaming stations. But yeah. I want people to know, I actually went and looked that you can get a 30-day free trial on Hulu. So for anybody who wants to watch it, just wait until all three. it's all up there and then do, do your third. You have 30 days. So you can, you know, you can watch it for free and then just, can your subscription and you won't pay anything and that's how they get you right <laughs> i know you forget to do it but if you just make a note you can do it so. um now uh i want to get your uh insights uh, everybody it's nat geo and hulu and it's uh, february 13th um which is that's when it kicks off so. that's a monday right yeah it's a monday like, yeah that's it that's the first two episodes um I, I want your opinion on uh, the NDAA. We're going to get to the report in a second. But when you have 40 pages of, of, of law and legislation, right, that are inserted in, into this for what may be, in, in this to this extent for the first time, uh, dealing with UAPs, UFOs, um, how good is this? And do you think that Washington is taking it serious? And if it is, you know, the words, you know, this is written into law, because there's a couple of components to this that nobody's talking about that nobody wants to mention. One of them, historically, that we've been talking about all night, uh, the history of things, is that the ODNI and the, D- and, and the Department of Defense are mandated to go back to January 1st, 1945, and investigate and revisit all of the military reports. That's, like, huge. And the rest of the NDA, okay, that's great. But that right there 
is a really, really big deal. It's something that the UFO community has been uh, screaming about from the beginning, that we, we have other stuff to talk about here. It's not just these two or three cases. Yeah, it is huge. I can hardly imagine how they're going to do it in any timely fashion, really. But yeah, it, it's extraordinary. And I think I think it's also extraordinary that they're offering these whistleblower protections for people to be able to come forward and talk to Congress about sensitive matters relating to UAP. I mean, the whole thing is incredible. If you look back over what we've been living with since the close of Blue Book or even before that. I mean, you know, I think that it's easy to find fault with these things if people like to focus on, oh, they didn't do that or they didn't do this or, but just the fact that it's happening at all is sort of what amazes me because I, I you know, I started doing all of this in 1999. So I've seen this incredible transition. And so it's hard for me to, you know, to be too critical of what I see happening when I put it in the context of what life was like before 2017. And so to me, with whatever problems there might be with the NDAA, and you know, for instance, that there's no the GAO should have been is no longer given oversight. I mean, there are certain things in there. There's stuff about SAPs that you know maybe they're not going to release certain information. We don't know how much is going to be made public. All of that, but still, just the fact that it's on the books at all to me is absolutely extraordinary and. Obviously, there are some, at least some members of Congress that really do care about it. They're the ones that are making this happen. I don't know. And and so I just, I look at it through a pretty positive lens. Um, and I, I'm just amazed by it. Uh, you know what amazes me? When, when you see a budget, right? The stack, <laughs> how large it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and who's writing it? Uh, who's reading it for that matter? Who's got the time to sit down and, and read all of the content. And then you get to the section on UAPs and you read through that. All I can ask myself is who were they talking to? There's too many specifics in here. There's input coming in and it's not from staffers. It, it's not, <laughs> there's, there's input coming from somewhere. Do you have any idea who was consulting uh, who was consulting on that section for UAPs? I, I suspect that Chris Mellon was. I suspect that the members of Congress talked to a number of people like Chris Mellon and got input and, you know, advice. And he's certainly one of them that's on the forefront of working with members of Congress. So, yeah, I'm sure I, I, beyond, I don't really know beyond that, but I think that Chris played a major role in making that happen. It smells melon-ish. It does. Yeah. It does. It's got a little melon smell to it, um, uh, which I love. I love the smell of melon. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, yeah. but, but the other part of it, um, which I was surprised about, we uh, in the UFO community have inserted whistleblower for witness is there a difference between the two in the NDAA? It's witness protection. You know, it, it, they use the word witness instead of whistleblower. Yeah, that's what it should be. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe I'm confused about that because a whistleblower is really somebody who's reporting on some kind of misdeed, you know, or crime. Yeah. A crime within the government that, that needs to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and these don't have to be people that see any kind of crime. They're just people who want to, report on what they know the, the only crime might be that they should have been brought to the attention of congress a lot sooner there should have been some kind of oversight to them so you know maybe some people would consider that a crime i don't know but i, I that's not the focus of it so maybe the use of whistleblower isn't isn't really accurate right here. right I mean, our, our community yeah. has has done that without without thinking about the differences between the two and yeah i and think th it's important to do that i mean i i i think i think i i actually wasn't careful about it probably myself so yeah there really is a difference and i think it's witnesses that they want to hear from now um uh to that end when we're talking about crash retrievals that 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 would in my mind it would fall into some SAP program with Lockheed out here in the middle of the Mojave Desert, as opposed to uh, pilots and things that are going on in the skies that are getting reported, which have been compiled into the most recent report. 
Is there a way uh, with the NDAA or the Senate or Congress to get to a witness from, say, a backwards engineering program that may be going on somewhere in the Nevada desert? Is there a way to do that? And do you think that the NDAA, that's part of its purpose? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the reporting, the mechanisms are that are, you know, I think they're still being worked out through which people will come to Arrow or to Congress. Um, But, you know, I think what's been happening so far is that people have come forward and offered their contribution to whoever they're speaking with. Um, So then I think, you know, if information is provided, then the members of Congress have to verify it. They have to go out and find what it is that they're being told. Um, It's a long process. And I think they're still working out the the mechanism by which people will go through this process. Um, But some of them already have begun. Some of them have already been talking to officials from Arrow and to congressional staffers. Um, But it's going to be interesting to see to what extent members of Congress will really be able to get to the bottom of some of these reports I mean, even if it's a high level person that's reporting something within their own experience, it's just that one person's information, maybe they won't be able to track it down. Maybe they won't be able to confirm it. If something is off in a, in a corporation like Lockheed, um, then there's also kinds of issues around what, what kind of um, control these companies have over their own possessions. There's, there's inf- you know laws about proprietary issues around something that is in their possession, they may not be required to reveal it to the, a, a government agency. I mean, there's a lot of complexities that have to be worked out. And then there's also the question of how much of this will be made public, even if they do find out things. Well, um, I'm, down, uh, I'm, I'm down the street from Lockheed. I'm looking for the flying saucers. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be flying them. They just got them in a vault somewhere so they can reverse engineer them, right? You got to for a test drive at some point. Uh, but yeah. uh, uh, I've been waiting. Haven't seen it yet. But I, then again, I don't know if I would say it uh, on the air uh, either. I, I yeah. like where I live. Um, right. So um, it, it's just going to be a long and complex process, and we just hope for the best. And, but, you and, know, if something comes out of a, a special, something really sensitive is reported to Congress that has national security implications, I don't think it's going to be made public. And it maybe it shouldn't be. There should probably be some things that shouldn't be made public. And, you know, that's going to be a tricky thing uh, for how, the, how they're going to decide that. And <laughs> will stuff leak? You know, all these questions that we don't know yet. We don't know what's going to happen. But it's just a great... It's just great that it's begun, that it's happening at all. That's how I look at it. Yeah, I just never know what the next day is going to bring, right? It's, it's always really something. exciting. It's it an is. exciting it, time. It really, it truly, really is. It truly is. So with um, there are three things in play here that I want your opinion on. So we had the UFO hearing, uh, Bray and Moultrie, uh, the, the two first, uh, I, what, what would we call them? Are they witnesses? Well, they were called to testify. Yeah. I, I mean, I, the, the Congress called them witnesses, but you're right. Yeah. Right. So we had Bray and Moultrie uh-huh. and then uh, on the front and back side of that, uh, we had the two reports uh, from ODNI and in the first report. So if we look at it in a linear sense, first report comes out, like you said, um, we've got we've got questions because it's not us. It's not them. So we've got the other bin that we're lumping all of this stuff into, right? So we got that out of the first report. Pretty cool. And then Bray and Moultrie uh, testified, ah, man, it's just Chinese drones, right? This is all military. There's no ET component here. Um, and I think Andre uh, Carson had a little bit of frustration with that. But nonetheless, that, that was in the middle. Then we've got the latest report. That is in contrast of Bray and Moultrie's reporting, but it's also a little bit contrasty to the first report, too, as well. Um, when you start to digest all of this, what goes through your mind? Do they even understand what is happening, or are they just holding back? I mean, yeah, so the the fact that the legislation refers to crash retrievals and reverse engineering, of course, is in direct contradiction to what 
Bray and Moultrie said, where there was none of that. So, I mean, I, I assume that they're, they are able to say things in such a way that they're not lying. Um, if they say they don't have proof that there's anything extraterrestrial, well, they probably don't have hard proof of it. So, you know. Are you referring to Bray and Moultrie or the yeah. report? Yeah, to Bray and Moultrie, I mean, and the, that whole universe of people who will, will they, they're just so distant from, you know, acknowledgement of anything strange about it, right? If, if that's what you're getting at. Whereas opposed to the Congress is way more open to asking the tough questions and they seem to really get it. I mean, those con the members of Congress have received enough briefings, classified briefings to understand what we're dealing with here. And, and, um, but they're not going to come out and really say it directly, but I don't know how much people like Bray and Moultrie actually knew. Uh, yeah, they may be purposely kept from knowing certain things so that they can go out and talk about it like that. Leslie, do you remember, I'm sure you do, when, uh, I think it was Gallagher, I could be wrong, but uh, one of the members of the subcommittee said, okay, so, but what about Malmstrom? Yeah, Air I do Force remember Air. that. Yeah. And, and Bray goes, I don't. Do you know anything about that? And yeah, exactly. Do you know? I, I, we we don't know. All right. Is, is is that a situation where they honestly don't know when they? I think should? so. I think that it's not like they've been sitting around studying history of UAP. You know, they just <laughs> brought on. Is there you know, brought onto this job? No. I mean, I wasn't surprised that they didn't know. To tell you the truth. You know the <laughs> the members of the UFO community. Oh come on, right? I know. <laughs> But, you know, this is what they're into. These guys aren't, that's not what they're doing with their time. They're like bureaucrats. They've come in to try to organize this task force or whatever, you know, and they're not focused on the studying stuff from the history books. So well, it was it, kind of amusing, but it wasn't surprising to me. It was very amusing. And if they, if they are continuing to choose, you know, and pick this low hanging fruit of, of military reports, They've got a couple of things that are right in front of them. And I would think that Rendlesham should be something that has a pretty severe paper trail to it. The witnesses are all still alive. And we have um, a, a collection of data, too, as well, that goes along with it. Shouldn't they be looking? Shouldn't Malm, uh, Malmstrom, well, Malmstrom, too, shouldn't mm -hmm. Rendlesham be part of, of this research? And if they're going to look back to 1945, even though that was in the United Kingdom, but it was the United States Air Force. Mm -hmm. Should Rendlesham become part of the conversation? I would think so. I mean, if they're going to go back and look at cases in previous decades, that's certainly one of the ones that stands out. I would agree with you in terms of evidence and witnesses. And it was spectacular events. So I, I would think so. But I don't know how much they're going to go. They're going to get into these sort of cold case reviews, you know, of things that happened decades ago. I mean, they're, right now they're just trying to get set up. You know what I mean? They're nowhere near ready to do this kind of stuff. They're just trying to get some staff in there and get organized and get the data collected into one location. And, you know, it's a slow process. So, yeah, but it would make sense to me. I agree with you. But if they're going to review cases, that's certainly one that you would think would be at the top of the list. If you were going to hand something off to uh, Kirkpatrick or, or Moultrie or Bray, what would the case be that you would ask them to take a look at? Well, I don't know. You mean a historical case? Um, a military case. That's a good question. I mean, uh, I mean, I think about the Iranian case. I mean, I, there are so many cases. Uh, I just also whether... A lot of the, I don't know if you can hear the wind, it's howling here, but. Um, that was crazy. That was yeah, I hope it's not too noisy. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd have to think about that to say like one particular case. I mean, uh, some of them, you know, the really older cases, they're not going to, there's not going to be anybody around that can tell them what happened. They're just going to have to look at documents. Um, so, you know, it's a good, I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I mean, um I mean, Rendlesham certainly is one of the stronger ones. Um, there's a lot of you know, the Iranian case has always fascinated me because of the in, the the long report that the U.S. government filed on that case. Absolute, 
details, but we've we've lost Parvis Jafari. He died. So, you know, I don't know how much they're going to be able to go into these older cases, really. Yeah, um, the uh, with the um, uh, you've mentioned the Iranian case now like five times tonight. I don't know. I just find that one fascinating. <laughs> An incredible case. And so when you just when you just have the aspect of scrambling uh, Iranian jets, right, just right there. But the backside of that story is the United States Air Force stepping right in. And, and collecting data and interviewing and, and then, like you said, writing it up. This was a right. very, very big deal uh, to the United States Air Force, wasn't it? It was. And, I mean, I, there, was a, there was this assessment. I mean, I can't remember. The, I have it in my book here. But the DNI assessment that was written on that case, which said, um, you know, this is a – I forget exactly. This is a perfect example of, of – you know, a UFO case that of why it's important. I, I, I mean, I, it would take me a minute to find it in my book, but it was this assessment that was like giving it A plus, A plus, A plus mm-hmm. from the uh, DIA. And this was at a at a period in history where we have we had told the American people that we we had no interest in UFOs. We weren't studying them. There was nothing to them. They weren't worthy of investigation. And yet you have this report from the DIA on this case that shows absolutely the, the opposite attitude from whoever wrote it. I think his name was Colonel Moy or something, M-O-O-Y. It's just a stunning assessment that they wrote after writing this four-page, single-paged report on what happened in that case. So I, I just I find it so interesting because it's in such contradiction to what they were saying publicly. Yeah, the one part about that, well, there are so many parts about that case, but... Um, the the pilot was ready to pull the trigger. Yeah, that was part of East Jafari. Yeah, <laughs> he's ready to pull the trigger, and when he decides to, the systems are shut down. Exactly, it happened more than once. Yes, and you know it was just chilling. I mean, just at the moment he was going to fire that missile because there was a large diamond shaped object that was kind of sitting up there. And and then there was the projectiles were coming out of it Mm -hmm. and they were like heading for his plane. And he thought he was going to be attacked or something. So he was, he got his missile locked on to this object, the smaller one. And just when he was going to press the trigger, it would, everything would shut down. It's just, and then the thing would move away and it would come back on again when it got to be a certain way. Right. You know, it was, it was only when it was a certain distance of, of uh, closeness to him. And he also lost all his radio communications and everything went out in his plane. Um, yeah, it happened at least uh, certainly twice, maybe three times before he decided, I, I think I better go back down. <laughs> yeah, and, and he's heading back. They're like, what happened? What do you mean? What happened? I, uh, I, I had nothing. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's fascinating to read the report for it those is. who haven't read it. Cause it's one of the more detailed U.S. government documents that I've ever seen on a, on one case, you know, just it goes for three or four pages, a single space, you know, absolute every detail about that case and what happened and what the thing looked like and how it behaved. All of that's in there. Um, and then this assessment that gives it this high rating as a, a, a case of interest is it's just fascinating. Before I, I let you go, Leslie, and I know it's New York and it's late and it's late. You know, yeah. you've, you've got stuff to do tomorrow. Um, the, uh, the turnover every year, right here we are, it's January, uh, of 2023, every year we go through the same cyclical motion, which is, all right, this is the year it's mm-hmm. happening this year, right? This is it. This is it. Is, is 2023 the year? How do, how do you feel about things? Do you think, uh, we're about to, uh, uh, about to uh, get exposed to things that we're going to have to figure out a way to handle it? Well, when you say the year, the year for what? Disclosure. I the- don't think, so. I mean, I, I don't think it's that. No, I wouldn't. Uh, depending on how you define disclosure. How do, you, how, are, how do you define I, it? Well, I mean, I, I define it. It's a word that comes from the UFO community, which I think they define as an official acknowledgement that we're, 
being visited by ET or something along those lines, right? An official acknowledgement that, okay, folks. We're not uh, alone. We're not alone. We haven't been alone for as long as, however long they might decide to say. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I feel that it's more going to be a gradual unfolding of information. I, I, there may come a point where that will have to be acknowledged. I mean, I think it's we're inching closer to that, but I don't necessarily think that level of acknowledgement will happen this year, but I think we're going to make a lot of progress this year. But who, what do I know? You're asking me. I'm not. A, I don't have a crystal ball. I may be completely wrong. You know? uh, well, I, I would have never have thought that December of 2017 would would happen. And me neither. What you did, and well, and you, I mean, it was it was what Lou did. Lou resigned, <laughs> and then he decided he wanted to go into the public. And I was called to this meeting for that reason. But really, Lou Elizondo is the one that made it happen. I just had the full good fortune of being able to bring it to the New York Times. But really, the credit goes to him. And he changed everything by resigning from that program, writing that letter to the Secretary of Defense. I couldn't believe my eyes when I first read that thing, that, that his letter of resignation when I was sitting there in that meeting in Washington. I could not believe it. You know, <laughs> now it just doesn't seem like, OK, that, that big a deal, you know, <laughs> But what, anyway, it, it was a shock. It was just like I, I could not believe my eyes when I was there um, at that meeting. I'll never forget it. Are, are, are you sitting on something now? Um, are you working on something uh, as far as uh, research go with UAPs? And, and is there something uh, right around the corner? Um, I'm always, I mean, Ralph and I are always trying to get something together that we can bring to the Times. And hopefully we'll be able to do something in the next few months. And so I'm talking to a lot of people. I got a lot of sources. I'm trying to keep tabs on what's happening within this new trajectory within Arrow and the Congress that a lot of you know new witnesses are getting involved with. So that's really interesting to me to kind of try to monitor that as best I can. Talk to people who are involved, um, and you know just following up leads. It takes a lot of time to do the work that you never publish, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just always following up on things, talking to people, uh, keeping tabs on things. And then a lot of it just never sees the light of day. Um, but it, it takes a lot of time anyway. So I hope I just hope that we'll be able to, to get something out there soon. But were I don't you, know. Uh, uh, one last question. Uh, were sure. you surprised about uh, Representative uh, Tim Burchett? Uh, on a few occasions now, uh, being extremely vocal and critical uh, about the United States government. His words, not mine. I know. He's, uh, he's quite uh, yeah, covering, yeah, covering up uh, the UFO issue and evidence. Um, were you surprised about that? I mean, I, I don't know if surprised. I remember the first time I, I was actually there for the hearing in May, and he he was there. He was the one only member of Congress who came to that hearing who was not part of the committee. So he was sitting in the, you know, in the opposite where the members of Congress were. And I remember as soon as that thing was over, he was ranting and raving right there in the, in the same, in the room about how, how pathetic it was and how it was all a cover up and the media was all over him with their mic. I mean, I took some videos with my cell phone of him in that moment when, and, and he was just like, saying this was like I could have written this thing in this it was like an eighth grade presentation they couldn't even get the slides up oh he was this he, is a jam he, it's he a... hasn't changed he has not changed his tune since then I mean he's very very vocal about um it's it's fascinating to me I don't know it's all a cover up and he makes the point should should the should the agency that's at fault here be the one doing the investigation should the Department of Defense be the one in charge of this investigation? I mean, he raises that question. And so, yeah, to, stand, know, to stand there in the chambers, right? Yeah, it, he did it right there after this. I mean, it was it was pretty intense. I mean, I, you know, he's a bit, you know, he's a bit of a loose cannon, but <laughs> put it mildly. Um, but he's he makes his point and he's passionate about it. He uh, used, when he used the word sham in the chambers, right? This was a sham. He does say something. I mean, it was a bit much. 
<laughs> my government, your government is lying. It reminded me of what's his name in the movie Network, right? Well, just, think, yeah. just losing it. He's just kind of loses it. And he has this very, he's got this whole religious component to him as well. Um, so he, he's just sort of a, a, a guy out there doing his thing. I don't think he really uh, blends in with the rest of the members of Congress very well who are in charge of this. He's not, he's not part of the committee, you know, the committees that are making this happen, but he obviously feels very strongly about it and he doesn't hold back on his opinions, you know? Yeah. I don't think he'll be, a, a, a invited to too many committees. If no, he, I think he's. he's Probably lost a little favor among some people, I would have to say. But well, in, in a weird way, uh, but I'm glad that you bring that up because in a weird way, um, he is saying the things that, you know, a member of a committee can't necessarily say in public. And True. and he is speaking for them. He's speaking for Rubio, right? He might <laughs> be speaking for the American people, too. Of course, a lot of people feel the way he feels yes so he may be also trying to represent a certain group of people and he's just letting it hang out you know he's not Thank i don't you. know he's a he's an interesting guy i mean i was able to actually meet him and talk to him a bit in his office the day of the hearing and he's an interesting guy i don't know <laughs> i just don't you know i don't know if he's crossed a line that maybe uh is not serving him anymore but he just keeps doing it, so yeah, I, 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 color to things, right? Well, I, I was uh, I was on a, another show last week, and we were talking about this exact issue uh, around uh, timber chat. And I said, you know, what's the alternative? Not to have somebody like him? I, I don't like that world. He I'm adds okay color. He adds color and energy oh. to it. Yeah, I'm okay with right? it. I I, I yeah. really am. Well, um, Leslie, th again, thank you so much. I know that you're very busy, and and uh, but uh, tonight was an absolutely amazing conversation, and I look thank forward you. to UFOs investigating the unknown, and that's going to be February 13th, everybody, on Nat Geo next, next evening. It'll be on Hulu, and I look forward to the next thing that you publish. Thank, thank you so, you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. It was really fun. You're the best. Leslie, thank Take you care. so much. Don't okay. change. Don't change. <laughs> Don't ever. <laughs> I'm not planning you. to. <laughs> thank you so much. Have a great okay. night. Bye. Leslie Kane. Thank you so much. And uh, Leslie's got a busy day tomorrow. She's on the East Coast. She's in New York, of course. And uh, we took this as far as we could tonight. And uh, just thank you for that. And, and Leslie, taking the time. Uh, to hang out with all of us here. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And what is going on uh, tomorrow night on Fade to Black? Oh, tomorrow night, the one and only Debbie Cobble is with us tomorrow night. Debbie Cobble, subject of Bud Hopkins' book, Intruders. That is tomorrow night here on Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And uh, I've got to get out of here. And for some reason, oh, there it is. There it is. All systems go. Tomorrow night, Debbie Cobble. And then Wednesday nights, we've got Sarah Breskman Cosme with us. So we've got a great week ahead on Fade to Black, which is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceBoyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Debbie Cobble. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.